Hey everyone and welcome to this next episode of the Company Road podcast. I'm going to say that sometimes you do need to ruffle a few feathers to achieve a particular outcome within your organization. So in this week's episode, we explore innovation from a provocateur's point of view. Things we'll be exploring are what's acceptable, what can you get away with, and what could possibly go wrong. A self-named agitator for good, let me introduce my next wonderful guest, Max Carlis. He spent over a decade using design and strategy to help businesses and projects to get from A to B in creative ways. And he's now taking this approach to individuals through career coaching and specializes in supporting athletes to build a fulfilling life after sport. His experiences include taking Lloyds Bank in the UK through its first seven hackathons, setting up Dead Pony Club as part of the Innovation Labs, founding a charity to save the United Nations, which it didn't, doing the world's biggest research into athlete career journeys and getting fired by a design agency, as well as working randomly as a harbour master, kindergarten teacher in China, and running an off-road sound system around extreme sports events for Red Bull. So this conversation is a total roller coaster. so hop in and enjoy. Thank you. Hey, Max, welcome to the show. Really lovely to have you on as a guest, as someone who I, well, I've known for a little while, but I, I believe you're a bit of a master when it comes to adapting to new environments and helping others to do the same, really. You're a bit of a restless entrepreneur, in my view. You've had a, a number of experiences that we'll get into, obviously, but at heart, you've been able to transform many a traditional institution and, in fact, mindset at a more individual level. You've done a lot of work in the customer experience area, in innovation, but you've also earned your stripes when it came to, to getting people together to solve problems in some rather novel and disruptive ways, which I'm sure we'll get into as well. And now you're using your knowledge of innovation to help other people find their own pathways within their careers. But let's start with a bit about you. What's been your experience of being an entrepreneur in one way or another? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Great to be here. I've got to come out of the block straight away. And I just admit that I feel a little bit sick in my throat when I hear the word entrepreneur. I've been thinking about this before coming on, and I think it's an amazing adjective. It's a terrible pronoun because I think having worked in innovation, I find the word is very divisive. And I believe entrepreneur is probably quite divisive as well, because it's hard to scrape off the ego, I think, from the word entrepreneur, because entrepreneur has that kind of ego and big character about it. So mm. I'm going to dive right in and uh, challenge the word entrepreneur and say, I choke on it. And I'm okay with it in a way myself, but I choke on it because I think that other people around the organization here, entrepreneur, and it's a bit like the difference with Americans and Europeans and fancy cars, I think, where in America, you might look at a fancy car and the, the people on the street go, gee, look at that successful guy. And in Europe, we see someone driving a fancy car and we just think, wanker. <laughs> so it, it, it's a fair cop to say I have had an entrepreneurial period to my work in design strategy, but I think it's worth calling out that I, I'm trying to move on from the label. Yeah, fair enough. Have a sip of tea, but without <laughs> spitting it, Good morning, Chris. <laughs> the Englishman needs his comforts. That's it. Well, I'm glad that prompted a reaction in, in one way or another. <laughs> I think just in terms of the word, if we break it down and what sits behind, have you got either an understanding of it that you agree with mm. at a different level? Is it just the badge and what it stands for? Is it more the labeling that you're taking issue with? I think it has a place, absolutely. And I think it belongs in places, maybe a Harvard Business Review that reflects on the challenges of someone acting to implement entrepreneurial approaches within a corporate structure. It makes sense intellectually. So taking more of an academic view and breaking down, oh, we're trying to replicate the entrepreneurial spirit within a corporate environment, despite the constraints. It makes sense on an intellectual basis. But I think we bring in the human nature, different personalities. And I used to say this thing about innovation projects, the word innovation is very divisive where half the room is going to salivate and get really excited, groovy new things. And half the room is going to roll their eyes and go, Jesus Christ, here we go again. I just think that entrepreneur is an easy badge for the naysayers who aren't into change or innovation to latch onto and just you've lost them from the moment that word is uttered. I, I did come up with a remedy at the time to address this divisiveness of the word innovation, which is let's find something we can agree on. So I, I took Tim Castell's definition of innovation. It's got to be new, it's got to be realized, and it's got to be of value. Those three 
aspects. And I like to dive in immediately and say, forget the word innovation, however you feel about it. We are going to try and do something new and we're going to try and realize it to a certain level. And it's going to try and achieve these things that we can quantify. And by breaking through and going beyond the word innovation, but just clarifying how new is this going to be? What kind of value does it need to add? And how realized, how far are we going to take this? You can bypass that and get everyone on the same page and just say, never mind how you feel about innovation. This is what we're trying to achieve. And now discuss what we're trying to achieve and having parked the divisive question. And where did that go? I mean, you, you obviously, a reframe is always helpful, particularly if it means people can get more on board with it. Did the naysayers come in and welcome you with open arms and minds? Did it go well for you? Yeah, they embroidered a red carpet for me after that. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's continual battles. I think there are further levels to this. There, there are various potholes that anyone acting intrapreneurially can try to avoid. I think it's pretty, pretty interesting to, once we've parked the issue of innovation, to get into what does good look like for these people? So I might just summarize my background where I did design strategy for 10 years. Five of those were in the innovation labs at Lloyd's Banking Group, where I had a lovely role where my job description was basically to poke the boundaries with a stick. And I was probably known for doing things like running the first seven hackathon series, delivering weekly events that brought in different ideas and different thinking from the outside in and a license to basically set up projects that tried to change the culture there. It was all about this mantra that the future didn't necessarily belong to the big, it belongs to the fast. I started off on the strategy and product side, and then I shifted into events and culture side. I think my philosophy in this space is probably about trying to unite strategy and culture. For me, strategy is more of a masculine thing. It's more direct. It's about straight lines, it's about hard numbers. It's quite blunt. Whereas the culture and events side, the culture side is more of a feminine kind of approach where it's a bit more subtle, it's a bit more curvy, it's a bit more discreet. But we ultimately need kind of the two sides here to, to come together for an organization to shift, I think. So that's probably useful context. For a couple of years now, I've gone on to do career coaching, specializing in athletes who want to move into life after sport and basically using the same sort of design methodologies and approaches to help people get from A to B rather than helping businesses and projects get from A to B. To come back to your question, no, bashed all sorts of heads a lot. The first mistake I made was that when people weren't excited by the things I was developing, I made them wilder and madder because that's what makes me happy. And actually what they're really looking for is solutions that will solve their damn problems. So a big learning for me that I, I learned the hard way was if I'm not part of the solution, I am just another problem to these people. So that was a, a rookie error as I got into that role <laughs> back at the bank. How do you find that balance between provocation and irritation? And how do you navigate that path successfully, do you believe? I've tried to kind of own it. And it, it stems from the innovation and culture work plus the coaching work, which is my plan is basically to be what I said at the bank was my job is to be frightening, but in a good way. And I would say that in the coaching work, my job is to be quite annoying, but in a good way. So I try and own it and say, I'm likely to be annoying, but it's worth it. So it's this notion of a lovable rogue in a sense. Do you, do you remember the, I suppose, the process of getting into that role to begin with at Lloyd's, what you went through, why you thought you were chosen for that particular role? They had basically said, I, I was at LSE doing a, a master's degree and a module in innovation for which we did a project on uh, the future of banking for Lloyd's. I wasn't really aware at the time, but Lloyd's frankly couldn't give a crap about these students telling the bank what they should do in future. But I didn't, I hadn't read the script. So I was pestering the bank and saying, we've invented the future of banking and I'd like to stick around and make sure you do it, please. And I kept pestering them long enough that they said, oh, for fuck's sake, right, come on then, come and join us. We could do with someone annoying like you basically, to help us shift forward. Some of the managers there said, actually, having a kind of in-house upstart to help challenge what we're doing would be useful. So I think some of the more progressive managers would use me to irritate people on their behalf. Yeah, okay. So like a secret weapon, you were just pointed at the right direction, at the right problem, and you would just uncover all sorts mm. of things. <laughs> yeah, it was a kind of reframing project where the bank was really hung up on, oh, we're very high risk. We're very high risk. We can't do anything. We're very high risk. So I would put on events like 
innovation in high risk industries. So I brought in Formula One racing, the military and oh, hospitals to come and talk to us about their innovation stories, where if they screw up, people die to try and reframe the idea that we're high risk. We're not. Yes, we've got to protect people's money and security and privacy, but let's stop this blanket. Oh, we're high risk. We, sh- we can't do anything. Otherwise, I think one of my favorite early projects was I managed to get some budget to invent a website without any words on it. So a project called Vero, I worked with a design agency on. So the idea that would be that we create something so gorgeous and intuitive that it would be just an absolute pleasure to get around it because banking websites are very wordy. And I just sold it on the idea that car companies have prototype cars. Why don't we have a prototype bank? That was okay, but I was still in quite an egotistical, younger stage of doing this. So I think I made it a bit too much about me and it wasn't particularly addressed. It wasn't tied into anyone's problem that was keeping them up at night. So yeah, that was a, another learning. It sounds like a, a very interesting role and where you took it both from taking on the challenge, but also mm. in, in applying a, a fresh perspective and new approach to what they were doing. I suppose, where did you spend the most time? Is it in strategy land? Were you more in that discovery and implementation and ideation type space? Were you quite focused around the outcomes and the outputs and what it would deliver? Where was the center of gravity for these types of projects? Definitely found my home in the culture and events side of things. Mm. The strategy side was full of who could be the most serious person in the room, which is not my natural skill. And (laughs) in an environment that is drowning in presentations and graphs and decks and all the rest of it, I couldn't compete on that level. I've always sort of had this idea that I'd, I'd kind of like to be the fittest person in the library or the smartest guy in the gym. I think it's better to be smart about who we're competing with and how. So I found in a culture and events side of things, really receptive because we were expected to deliver new things. One of the favorites that came out of that was, and it's a nice contrast with the wordless website that was early on in my work there. By the end of it, I was doing something called Dead Pony Club, where Lloyd's Bank, if you don't know, it's got a a very highly esteemed logo that's 250 years old. And we have very clear instructions, do not mess with the logo, it will not be tolerated. So we started Dead Pony Club, which was an opportunity basically to siphon off the after work grumbling in the pub where people would moan and bitch about what's going wrong and say, well, stop moaning and bitching about it. Let's go and make something really subversive. So we would basically get together and design the bank's worst nightmares. And I would rotate which team were invited along to Dead Pony Club to talk about the problems they're facing. And then we would design their worst nightmare. It was an amazing experience where it was trying to turn this negative energy into more positive energy. But what we would do is we would break them into groups where each group would tackle it from a different perspective. One of them would look at what technology would be most frightening for a competitor to have, what would be the most frightening brand to come in, which celebrities would be behind this, and what animals. Animals was the best. Sometimes bands, but animals is the best. The most abstract, because it stops people thinking about it in a rational, logical way. A nice example of that is we did Dead Pony Club for the small business banking area. What we identified is that there was open banking was coming in, which meant there's going to be a lot more competition and fintechs entering the market. We take the results of Dead Pony Club and we turn it into a cartoon because no one else is circulating cartoons at the bank. And even bankers are human beings too that quite like cartoons. So we had an amazing artist who worked with us and he created this picture. You got Daddy Hippo, who's corporate banking. You got mummy hippo, who's retail banking. And then you got a little baby hippo that is retail business banking. We had it being attacked by a swarm of digital mosquitoes. This is the onslaught of the attack of the new wave of competition from open banking. I mean, you, you actually physically feel sick looking at this baby hippo being attacked by a swarm of metal mosquitoes. It's hard to quantify. I was always under a lot of pressure to quantify it the impact of innovation? What's the return on innovation? I don't know, but small business banking got twice as much money to defend itself following on from that. I can't take credit for it, but did we contribute? Did we change the conversation? I think we did. And that really was a good step forward because it was nice and edgy and exciting and very entrepreneurial very kind of startup style, but it was much better, much smarter way of being collaborative than my earlier attempts. It sort of begs a question around what it takes to evoke a response and a positive one at that that is rooted in 
participation in one way or another. And coming mm. back to what we were saying before around the naysayers, actually giving the forum for that to breathe and live quite happily, mm. but then to do something constructive with is an interesting way of approaching it because a number of companies would just rule it out in another way. They would just probably issue a directive and say, this is not how it has to be. This is not how it will be. Let's do this instead. Yeah. And it becomes a bit more authoritarian. Did you find uh, that you were almost combating against that having been the case? Yeah, I did find if you do something with no budget, it's bloody hard to stop you. Or permission. They can't or turn the budget. taps off. Yeah. They can't turn the taps off. And I've always thought that part of my job was to get fired, but for doing something I would be proud of, not something crap. I always felt that was partly why I was there. My job was to push the boundaries with a stick and push them. And if I wasn't getting in trouble, I wasn't sure I'd be fulfilling that. But yeah, you don't want to antagonize people unnecessarily. So a bit of a balance. But yeah, if you do a project without budget, who's going to stop you? On the boundaries side of things, how do you work with boundaries? Do you set them clearly in your head? Do you just push until you get a response? What's your view on risk-taking and boundaries? I had, thankfully, an amazing manager at the time, Sophie, who did a really good job of helping me understand the organization and the organization understand me. So I think I had mid-level aerial cover and then I had higher level aerial cover. So the highest level was the, the head of innovation who is basically not objecting and saying, you know, roll with it, see what you can get away with, but make sure it serves a purpose. But I had someone who was actively involved when we would engage and do events and work with, collaborate with other parts of the bank. I think they would kind of explain that I can be helpful, but if I've gone too far, go and talk to her and she'll sort it out. I had some decent cover and it was useful to have someone who trod more delicate political steps than me, definitely. Mm. How do you think they justified that to the board or the more senior leadership team in and around what was going on? If they were quite happy to let you run with it, but were they close enough to be able to really be able to report that on a more granular level? I think what we were basically involved in was more like the theatre of innovation than innovation. And that's what led to me leaving eventually. I stayed longer than I thought I would, but it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of doing stuff for fun and to stretch our minds about what we could achieve. But it was very hard to get anything truly implemented. I think we made a good job with changing the culture and the conversations. I don't think it was particularly effective. I, I used to definitely fall back on Einstein's quote about not everything that matters can be counted and not everything that can be counted matters. And I used to bring that up at the beginning of projects because People are always going to assess it about what's the return on investment here? What's the return on investment? And I would say, okay, well, let's take the hackathons. We've done seven. We've had about, I don't know, 750 people hands-on build a digital prototype together. There were three main tribes in the bank, effectively. There's the business side, the technical side, and the transformation side, all with a different idea of what good looks like technical side is it doesn't break. The transformation side is it changes on time. And the business side is it makes money. And we start learning how to break down those language barriers and understanding about what good looks like from different areas. So yeah, with the hackathons, we help break down the language barrier between groups. And we've got all these people who've hands-on experience of how to build in an agile manner. And then if you take the other side where we don't quantify how many people did this or did that, or we off the back of it, we would always prototype the best idea off each of them. So seven new projects launched. But actually, there's two stories which I think are even more compelling on the qualitative side. One of which is we actually had a kid bunk off school to come and join in one of our hackathons. That's really cool. Someone bunked off school to come and join in one of the hackathons. <laughs> and then another one was during an event, one of the designers comes up to me and says, thanks for letting me join in the hackathon. I'm loving this. This is amazing. He said, but you know what? Actually, I just want to confess something, which is I'm actually not really a designer at all. I work in finance, but I really wanted to come to this. So I've spent the last three weeks on YouTube learning how to do graphic design. And you know, that these are the kind of things where... You can't quantify that, but if you want to have adaptable people in your organization, that's amazing. So I try and preempt a lot of things, as you can see. So preempt what good looks like, preempt what innovation is or isn't, preempting how we're going to quantify this. Some of it, yes, we can measure. Some of it we can't, but it's still worthwhile. Get over it. I think there's, a, there's definitely a halo that comes with running initiatives and events like you've described where people just want to get involved. And it's just interesting to see how, from a cultural point of view, that in itself is divisive. It's yeah. bringing people in based yeah. on their skill set or interest or 
determination or career path or whatever it is, there, yeah. there are reasons that push people and draw people to those gatherings and events. And that's happening all the time in different parts of organizations. Yeah. It's not always in the same direction or in, the, in an orchestrated way, but it's almost playing to the organic part of how culture works. Yeah, it's nice to float stuff and see what happens. Some stuff builds traction, some stuff doesn't. I'm trying to think, I mean, just for the hell of it, we did an, a cricket match inside a glass atrium just because it's a glass atrium. <laughs> so just the idea of let's break things, it's okay. So yeah, that we had an indoor cricket match in the atrium. Actually, in the early days, I got to, I just found where, where the speaker system was for the emergency fire exit. And on the day we launched a new intranet called the Grapevine, I went and broke into that and played Marvin Gaye's, heard it through the grapevine and played it across the whole building just by sneaking into the, I don't know what you call it, the AV IT room and just plugging a, a little CD player in there. There was some stupid shit. But then we did these amazing things where on a reframing basis, there was the espressos, digital espressos. Every day, sorry, every Tuesday at 11 o'clock, we would have a guest speaker downstairs in the atrium. And we would just invite radical fintech entrepreneurs who were ready to take the bank down. We had a security expert who actually, he did a live experiment that I wasn't aware of, but he basically hacked a Wi-Fi enabled dildo to make a point about why your security digits on your phone should be six letters long. Five, not four. Anyway, so that was a live experiment that we hadn't seen coming. I got a billionaire in to come and speak, although I think I think he might have fired his PA after that because he turned up obviously pissed off that he was talking to a cafe full of sort of very mediocre banking employees and not the chiefs. But the regular talks every day at 11 o'clock, we'd get probably about 100 people together. Mm. And this began as a room of seven people who got together one day and, and talk about what the hell is Bitcoin. So that got a real momentum. And then we did an evening version of that event where we would invite people into the bank. And actually, rather than panels, I would tend to organize debates because panels are crap. I mean, sorry, but panels are crap. You've got everyone go, oh, and you're very nice and I'm very nice. And the only people who win in a panel are the people sitting on the panel. The audience are given platitudes and niceties. Whereas if you've got a debate, it's really cool. It's really good. So we did iOS versus Android operating systems. That, As got, a debate. that got really feral. But it's cool. People started to learn what happens at the boundaries between these issues. God, if there's one thing I could change, I would do away with panel events and have debates instead. You've sat in a few, I'm assuming. Yeah, I've moderated or gone on the teams. But I think it's just, if you want the audience to actually learn something, that with the debate, you really get to the boundaries of the issue. Whereas you get a panel together to talk about things and they're sort of saying, oh, I had lots of nice things. Oh, I hope I get some work from Lloyd's from doing this. Yeah, I'm picking up on a theme here, which maybe around some of the work and the experiments that you ran is that there, there has to be attention in one way or another for that to lead to something else. Do you feel like harmony inertia, it breeds apathy and it breeds a sense of status quo. What, what are some of the forces that can be used helpfully to, to bring about new fresh thinking, really? I think there's two things there. One of which is, there's a Camus quote on the difference between a revolution and a rebellion, which I've always cottoned onto and, and really highly valued. He says, the difference is that the, the reason a re revolution is respectable is because it's suggesting an alternative. Rebellion just says, oh, this is shit. But a revolution says, I think we've got a better idea that's worth fighting for. I've always been interested in people and projects where there is a clear alternative being proposed versus those where people are just whining, moaning, and no time for the whining or moaning. But if people have got alternatives, let's find the smallest possible thing we can do to test it and get on with it. Mm. I think there's got to be a purpose behind the antagonism and rattling people, not just for the sport of it. Not all ideas are equal, as we know, and they come in from different voices, different parts of the business or the organization usually. But how do you never get that? On that subject, we one of the most effective things we ever did was our banking app wasn't basically available to kids, teenagers, and other competitors were making their apps available to, to younger people. So we organized a day where a lot of the chiefs brought their kids into work. And then we basically ran a workshop where the kids told their parents how shit the app was because they couldn't access it and all their friends could and pointed a finger in the way that no one inside the bank could have done. So by bringing in the customers to point fingers at the executives and say, this is shit in ways that we cannot on the inside, that was really helpful. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing like a consumer voice or a an end user voice or any kind of external voice that 
is incredibly powerful, obviously, to play back mm. those findings more directly from an unsuspecting source, like you mm. say, very smart. Just thinking from looking forward from some of the things that you were doing there and I guess pushing boundaries, experimentation, the things that you've been talking about, what have you taken forward as something that consistently works well and what have you left behind and for what reason? I think what consistently works well is look for opportunities where people need to do something, not trying to get people to want stuff. We're not going to change what people need to get done. What I used to do is get as many coffees as possible to find out what keeps these people up at night. What are their problems? In a bank, it's relatively easy. There were always balanced scorecards that were spelt out and were often public saying, this is what this person needs to achieve within this time frame. I used to work with my manager, Sophie, because she would work at a level where she had much kind of clearer access of what do these people need to do. So I found it useful when she would effectively find the right people for us to work with, and then I would get deployed to go and do with it, because that saved a lot of time pissing into the wind of people who just weren't interested. So that was really helpful to find places where there was a good appetite to try things out. And I think in terms of collaboration, I used to encourage that we find the smallest thing we all agree on and get the hell on with it. Why don't we just write an article together? See if we can do that. Okay, we've done an article together. Why don't we do a workshop together? That went well, fine. Or if it didn't, what have we learned? Okay, well, now we've done that. Okay, maybe we could do a joint initiative to run an event about the cloud or something. I think just build a little success and then build a bigger success and then build a bigger one, incrementally building up these relationships rather than steaming in with a, right, let's go crazy, do a big hackathon, woo! Like no one's interested. So I think learning to just build up slowly, build a success on a success. Otherwise I've got something, actually I pulled it out. It's, I've got a minimum viable planning deck, which painfully through experience, I've pulled together a deck because we rarely start at the beginning of a project or an organization or something. We always come in, there's already stuff going on that we are blind to when we first arrive. So I've got a checklist of questions which guaranteed I will regret not asking if I don't ask them. So I have a, a checklist for picking up projects or roles to try and get good visuals on all the things that otherwise is going to blow up in my face. Yeah, okay. And then during that time, you transitioned markets, obviously, from the UK over to here in Australia. Have you adapted your approach in any way in that respect? Have you felt like you've needed to change your practices slightly? Ooh, it's probably more in a kind of personal way than a professional way in some ways, because although moving here was a big change, I became a parent at the same time. So if this is the Diff the change in moving from England to Australia, becoming a happily free man to becoming a parent, the change of becoming a parent is that big. And owing to that, probably my priorities in life shifted a bit. I began to care less, found it much harder to give a shit, frankly, about projects and companies and found my family's my priority. And I want a working life that recognizes and prioritizes that. And also I like working more with individuals. And I decided a couple of years ago to look back and actually, I haven't mentioned it, but we used to engage with a lot of accelerator programs to bring startups into the bank and try and foster change that way. And actually mentoring startups was probably the favorite thing. So I've been doing that with Startup Bootcamp in Melbourne. I'm doing some mentoring through Academy XI, which is a similar kind of thing. And career coaching is probably the nearest thing to a real job that looks like mentoring startups. So that's why I've been going down this path. I think probably worth just capping off the Lloyd story. There was an interesting episode that I left in the end. I stayed for five years, which was longer than expected. But there was an interesting case where I'd arranged with a crowdfunding platform. We were going to give everyone who works at the bank, it was about 80,000 people. Everyone at the bank was going to get 10 pounds to invest via the crowdfunding platform because I figured that if if we really want to change our working practices to be more agile, if everyone had a bit of skin in the game watching startups and if you watch a horse race, yeah, okay, but if I've given you 10 pounds and I put it on that horse, you're going to watch that race and you're going to see what's that horse's name, what color is it, how does it run, who trained it, how is it slower or faster, what's going on? And suddenly, when you've got skin in the game, even a tiny token amount, you're going to start absorbing and taking an interest, build that curiosity. So I was really excited about this project. And then the legal team at the bank said, we can't let this go ahead because it would be encouraging irresponsible investing to our employees. And at that point, I said, like, I'm sorry, like, that's idiotic. I just can't be part of this. I think I found my limit and said, thanks, but no thanks. All right. Um, 
So, so that yeah, that, pretty- that was the end of that. But it was, I'd probably look back and say that was the most enjoyable working time. License to kind of be the naughty kid in the class and get paid for it was quite fun. Yeah, it sounds great. I mean, the dream role for some others, I'm sure, particularly who were, I guess, a little bit more conservative in their roles within the bank would have either enjoyed it or not enjoyed it, as you say, it kind of split. Oh, totally. You <laughs> should interview some people who were also probably from the technical team, especially. You could get their view on things. What would they say, do you think? I think the technical team especially would say, and I definitely was guilty of this in the early days. Towards the end, I was better at this. But I think as the innovation team, we were a bit full of ourselves. We used to swan in a bit like the cavalry in our shiny outfits with our shiny ideas and our clean breaches, we'd arrive in the battlefield and the technical team who had frankly provided banking to 10 million people quite happily on their own before we arrived and been in the trenches and made this happen were understandably fairly dismissive of these punks turning up with ideas. So I think there was an issue definitely at the sort of cavalry infantry divide. We probably, enthusiasm would come across as arrogance, probably because the early days there was arrogance. That kind of divide where the rigorous detail required, and you've got more than 20 computer systems strapped together. You've got 50 departments collaborating together. It's designed to not change. The bank is designed to stay safe and keep everyone the hell out and keep it the same as it was yesterday. That's brilliant in the short term. It's just not very good in the medium to long term. Yeah, I think many organization or many a leader within an organization has tried a number of things, really. One one is to set up an innovation arm. It kind of isolates those efforts and then it's pointed at very specific things. In other cases, it's much more a change management feel where organizations are almost setting higher level visions and objectives and people and teams are almost encouraged to get behind that and that brings about the innovation. Do you feel like there's a perfect way for it to work? There definitely becomes an innovation is not my job if I'm not in the innovation team versus innovation is my job and there's a divide there. I think there's smarter ways to do it, which is kind of the best of both, which is I think there should be resources because you may not have them within the organization. So an innovation team and getting funded by other parts of the bank who are free to hire externally or internally. And I think, interestingly, there were different parts within the innovation lab as it grew from strategy and product, culture and events. But then there were different areas. There was a whole lot of different work streams. Some of them lent themselves better to being independent bodies. There was a sort of intelligence unit that was scoping out the market, seeing what's going on out there, especially with the fintech companies arriving and what they're doing, how they're doing it. That stuff's just brilliant to share around and should be independent and left to get on with it and share its insights. But maybe the more hands-on stuff, it's better to get that model of helping to build agency in other parts of the bank. I think it's just a question really around what would good look like from an innovation standpoint in today's organization, knowing that the speed of change, the mobility that's required of teams, the adoption, the flight risk that's usually there because teams aren't perhaps as as fixed as they once were. It feels anyway that there are many moving parts in that arena. So from an innovation standpoint, how could we set that up better? So if you were a leader or a you're working within an organization today and it was one of the banks in Australia or anywhere else, what would you start with, do you think? I mean, initially it's get the brief and say, hello, why am I here? I need to understand what's keeping them up at night, what the problem is that they felt the need to reach out and can only customize it built off the back of that. So you got the strategy and the culture. You need to do and under- take an understanding. What is your current strategy? What are you looking to change? What does your current culture look like? I tend to come back to experience design that gorgeous formula satisfaction equals expectations minus reality no one knows who came up with it sometimes attributed to morisachi but i used to bring that in a lot and i do with my career coaching stuff where to get the best results we probably have to work not just on the reality of the situation but people's expectations around it too so i think taking a stock take of where expectations are out of alignment is pretty critical. Once I understood the three tribes at Lloyd's, life became a lot easier. You got business, technology, transformation. Everyone's got a different idea of what good looks like. Okay, we'll work with that. But prior to getting that understanding, a lot harder. So I think trying to read into the strategy and the culture and then customize off the back of it. God, you almost make me want to go back and do this stuff. You're really living it. Want- Get on the phone to Lloyd's. See what they're up to. See if they'd have me back again. That'd be a good yeah. test. That, that's a good test of whether we did a good job or not. The £10 bet. 
or the yeah. pan investment, see if it's still on the table. We've talked a lot about yourself. Maybe we could just pan out and, and talk a little bit about the teams that you work with and the, maybe the types of attitudes and behaviors, the values that you're typically trying to instill mm. through the work that you do and what you typically get back. So what are your methods in getting people behind things in that respect? And what do you expect back from people? I think for a moment, I might just lean on the career coaching side of things for what you've said there, because I think we're talking more about an individual basis and the coaching is really more around the one-to-one, -one, whereas previously, what I've moved away from is working on businesses and projects. I'm seeing there is a kind of big secret around career coaching. Typically, most people who want to engage in, in getting support to progress their career feel they've got in a bit of a knot. No one comes to a career coach unless they've tried really hard, but ultimately quite painfully to resolve it themselves. I tend to find there is a kind of secret. Don't tell anyone. But typically, these people know what the answer is, but they just don't like it. I've just done a hell of a lot of research into athlete career transitions, and this is my new niche. There's massive parallels between sport and addiction. I've been to rehab myself 16 years ago to give up drinking, and that was the most educational experience of my life without doubt that has shaped my career more than anything, actually, to end up in a rut, stuck in addiction, and then the recovery program to climb out of that. Typically within a, a sporting organization, and I'd say it's probably similar within businesses, you've got a third of people who know what they want to do and they're actively pursuing it. You've got a third of people who don't quite know what they want to do, but they're actively experimenting. And then you've got a third of people who don't know and are inactive, not sure. And of those who are inactive, it's kind of in denial about the opportunities they have. Typically, the recovery sort of path would suggest there's only two reasons for that. One is fear and one the other is pride. Fear is if I look at these things, I just get this like, no, I get fear. I don't want to go, I don't want to go that like you don't want to look at a big scary bill or something. Or you don't want to look at a snake. Don't like that. Not looking, not engaging. The other one is pride, which is like, yeah, whatever. I'm better than this. Like, it doesn't apply to me. I'm special. I'm fine. Fearful ones are easier to work with. We can rationalize and normalize these fears and go like, God, we all have fears. Probably is the way to go through it. It's a much smoother path to go through it and accept it. The pride one is harder, but typically I find trying to promote people who are full of pride and say, you're amazing, you're fantastic, and you should go and mentor other people because you've got this nailed because you're so amazing. And eventually they sort of go, yeah. I've learned so much doing this because I think it's about making a socially acceptable way for people to engage and get towards that thing that they don't really want to accept. How has it played out? What are some of the results that you're seeing from listening yeah. to people to that extent? What are they now capable of doing, do you think? I feel a bit too early days to evaluate. So it's only nine months into focusing on the athlete side and I've only just released the research last month. So I'm about to go and pitch that to various clubs and associations as I try to basically step up and go from working with more random individuals to being part of the sporting establishment in Australia and building my credibility as a useful asset for people, particularly that third who are inactive around their careers. Careers are a big question. I'm often saying we've basically got three options, one of which is we talk to friends and family, which is lovely because we love them and we trust them and they love us, but they're also vulnerable to their own bias and bullshit, just the same as we are. Or you can Google it. You can get a quarter of a million answers in 0.68 seconds if you want, or you can take a tiny fraction of your salary and get one-to-one -one support to help you find your own solutions and make sure that you don't look back with any regret and you make the best of the cards you've been dealt. I think there's a growing trend and less screamishness about working with another person to just step back and untangle. And it's quite hard to get time and space in our lives to just pause and think about these things. So yeah, without going into a full me, me advert, that hopefully provides some context. I mean, obviously you've talked about your previous roles and now what you're doing currently in the coaching space. Maybe we can just loop back to, to you and yourself and what I suppose looking back drove you and debated you through those different stages it felt like mm. the standout and the ego was once there it then became something else you had different motivations but what do you think looking back on yourself and what do you think you what were some of the bigger learnings through that time that you reflect on yeah, spot on. I think there are three eras of my career. And something I say with the coaching clients is around sometimes we've got to learn to burn a different kind of fuel, particularly athletes tend to be high octane human beings who mm. need to learn to burn another fuel and a more sustainable approach. In my 20s, I was led astray by some terrible advice by my grandmother, which was, Max, you should do what the hell you like until you're 29. Then you could spend a year learning how to be 30. And I took this much too seriously and just basically grabbed the wrong end of the stick and 
ran with it very hard. And by the time I was 29, I ended up going to rehab. So thanks, Granny. I think what she means is be a kid as long as you can. And when you can't, don't. And then I got into my 30s where I did, I found a lifeline through this innovation work, which, yeah, the 20s was just ludicrous. You need another podcast for that. But in my 30s is when I did my master's, I found innovation as a way to engage in the workplace, which I hadn't previously managed to find very well. It was like, oh, I can be sort of entrepreneurial, but within a structure, this really works for me. And then I guess I became, as I became a parent around 40, there was just a kind of harder to give a crap about these projects. I got a bit weary of the sort of motivational corporate stuff where if I'm basically building a house on someone else's freehold, this is idiotic. I've got skills, I've got experience, I've got options, and I'm going to explore them. So grateful to all of the experiences, the painful ones especially, actually. I guess what I've taken away is there's a rich floor full of kind of cut up lost edits and randomness, which has actually been fantastic, particularly for the coaching stuff now. It all plugs in nicely. So it does feel like a sort of coherence was eventually found through a lot of pretty crazy meandering. That was a great answer. I think that two things that jumped out from what you were just saying, one is probably a theme around optionality and being aware of what options you have through stages of life. And the influence that other people have on you is a great one. And obviously, whether it's your granny or anybody else that you work with, your manager, your boss, your your organization, what it stands for, you can often feel like you're in the wrong place at the right time, at the wrong time, sorry. Yeah, so optionality. The other one's probably more around confidence, I feel. Sometimes when you're in a situation, particularly a work or, or a role, the optionality just shuts itself off anyway, but it feels like to leap or take a sidestep or to move in a very different direction feels very foreign. It's yeah. becoming easier, I believe, to experiment from a career's point of view than maybe it once was. It, it feels like you, you still need to back yourself to a degree and maybe there's mm-hmm. some validation that comes in from your peers, like you say, it could be your family, your friends, whoever, but that needs to give you the wind and the sails to propel a change of direction in some way. Yeah, something I've always thought important for entrepreneurs that I've struggled with over my journey is trying to keep a low emotional center of gravity is what I keep thinking about. The people who I've spotted who are particularly the ones who are more naturally entrepreneurial, they have this lovely stoic quality of, there's some story about a monk, I think. There was a family and they gave him a baby because they couldn't look after it. They had to go off and fight the war. And then the monk just sort of says nothing, says, okay. And then I can't even remember the story. But, That's going to be good. You had me on the edge of my seat. I was, I was know, waiting no, for that. Who doesn't like a monk and a baby story? <laughs> Never heard a monk and a baby story. So. <laughs> uh, but it, it's basically just, okay, it's more like Rudyard Kipling's If Poem. Treat these two imposters just the same, victory and, and failure. It's the more we can laugh at the absurdity of these little things in life. And we lose a job or someone says no, or it's like, you know, at time they can feel like, ah, freak out. Oh no, this is awful. The ones who have this steady, just keep trucking. Yeah. I get an arrow in the head. Just keep going. It's okay. At one point I was a kindergarten teacher in China and I had this approach, which maybe I should have taken to the other jobs. But the strategy was to get me through this, hate them all equally. Basically, this lovely sense of indifference. And I think trying to get a bit more indifference to this stuff, which Jack Teagarden's song, 100 Years From Today, look it up. It's a lovely song. It's all about like, 100 years from today. Who's going to give a shit? So just trying to like do what we can. And maybe the, the cleverest thing I've ever come across is the serenity prayer from my AA practice and recovery work. The serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It was thanks to that. I used to argue with a lot of things, but when I went in to give up drinking and recovery, I came across the serenity prayer and I was like, I can't argue with that. That's so damn good. And that was the hook that helped me get onto a very positive path. And I think that's a lovely thing because again, with the coaching, people tend to get bothered about things that are nothing to do with them and in denial or ignoring the stuff that actually is their responsibility. That tiny little prayer nails the whole thing. Yeah, um, it's fantastic. What you're saying is an interesting one because you know, taking an opposite view or being a bit crit- critical thinking is often sometimes it's applauded, sometimes it's not. But actually having a point of view is what leads you to whether you, know, you feel something is right or wrong. And people talk a lot about instinctive behaviors and, and 
gut feeling and all the things that, that come about in business. And actually, if you can find something that aligns to what it is you stand for, then you're more more ready to accept it, yeah. apply it to your practice. But it's the methodology, I think. You can always ask questions. You can always be curious. Curiosity then leads you to whether something feels right or wrong. But without that, it feels like you're almost handing your control over to somebody else to take for you. Did you experience any of those feelings as you were going through your journey? Not sure quite like that, but possibly because I'm quite skeptical, verging on cynical that anyone ever changes their mind. I feel that most of us make a decision before breakfast and spend the rest of the day justifying it. Okay. I'm not very optimistic about people changing their mind. I'm more optimistic about discovering how people come to the views they've come to. I don't hold out hope to change it, but I have hope to understand it. And that will allow us to find a common ground and work together. So part of the kindergarten in China story and, and what you learn from that in accepting everybody equally is to accept all those points of views and everything that goes with it. So it's more acceptance rather than needing to understand. A lot more acceptance as I got older. Accepting, letting go, less control and less need for it. I just try and do the best I can. There's the lovely stuff in the 12 Steps Recovery Program is like we can't control other people, other places, other things. All I can do, the only stuff I can control is what's in this floppy body, which I crashed this morning on my bike with my kid on the back. We're all fine. This is all I've got to control. And it's so hard and so cliched, but all we've got is the present. I do get hangups on the past. I do worry about the future. So much time wasted. It is idiotic. And I'd like to make, my, I guess my to-do list is to do less of that, be more present. But I try and own my hypocrisies and acknowledge that's just being human. How do you feel that people respond to you for being that way? Interesting. I mean, I guess you're going to have to ask them. I think it's good to have an outlet for me with the coaching, which is the point is to challenge people constructively. That's why we're here. That's why we do the coaching. So I feel pleased to have an outlet because naturally that's how I am. I like to be sort of antagonistic for good reasons. Yeah, I just enjoy the contrary side of things, the paradoxes. People don't always have time for it. I think it's, there is an element of choosing a time when people just want to know if you want a cup of tea, not do you want a, a deep philosophical debate about something. So yeah, knowing a time and a place, definitely for meetings, having an agenda and put my hand up and say, I can get distracted. So if you want to achieve something in this meeting specific, if you could help me come back to it, that's fine. I think just be open and honest, be ourselves. I guess I, I cling on to the idea being ourselves is a good way to be. And then if it's working, it's working. If it's not, roll on. Try and find a place where we do plug in all right. Um, I was very lucky in the innovation work that I had this amazing role that fitted me personally and fitted them professionally. In the coaching stuff, I feel very fortunate to have evolved. I still very torn though on how much work is something that we have to love and how much work is actually someone just needs something done. Can you help? And I think it's interesting. We're very overeducated in the Western world. And I think it's a pity. I slightly wish that university was free, but only if you did something useful like I'm in favor of us doing like philosophy and plumbing. So when the economy is good, fine, go and do philosophy. But when it's not, go and be a plumber, please. Yeah, interesting. Maybe a last question in and around any advice that you would give to other people through their own journeys. But how do you feel through your career and what things are you looking out for as the signs of something being right in your work or just out of line? And at what point would you reconsider the working situation that you're in to, to consider op other options, do you believe? It's probably a bit like the rule for whether to get out of bed and take a piss during the night. Sometimes you wake up in the night and you think, oh no, I slightly need a piss. I've got a rule that if I think, oh, I think I want to piss on the third time, I go and have a piss. The rule of three? I think it's a rule of three thing. Also, <laughs> my sister suggested work probably should be good a third of the time, okay a third of the time, and shit a third of the time. Now, that resonated for me. Other people may want to adjust it and tweak it and say, no, I want good. I want work to be good 60% of the time and okay, 30 and shit, 10%. Have a think about what is acceptable to you. But if you're asking yourself the question, it, it it's maybe comes back to, I don't know, like irritating neighborhood noise. Just put it down in your diary when there was irritating noise because the police will want to see a record. Just keep a note of these things. And the third time you've written down, I don't like my job. Look at your options maybe. Because again, it's that thing like we have you know the answer you just don't like it yeah no it's that's definitely it I, I think we might wrap there back so i really enjoyed our chat and just 
by the virtue of all of the things that you've experienced through your career so far and you continue to do, it's always evolving. It's always open. You're always inspired by the environment that in which you're in. Mm-hmm. You're taking all of that on and you're applying previous knowledge, experience, and you're applying that to the things that you do today. And it's obviously opening up more and more doors. So, so I love it for that. And mm-hmm. I love the, the meandering conversation that we've had. I didn't, maybe I didn't <laughs> give you enough conversation structure. I didn't set any clear parameters. I kind of wanted to see how you would roam free in this uh, environment but hopefully you've enjoyed it as well. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's bringing back a lot of memories of interviews. I used to do job interviews and without fail, they'd say, this is the most fun we've had today, but no, we're not going to give you a job. I don't have to make you an offer. Don't put me on the spot. I don't know what I'd offer you. Yeah, but yeah thank you so much. Tell us a bit about where we can find you. Yeah, of course. I've got a website, Max Carlis, which is M-A-X-K-A-L-I-S. Dot com. Yeah, that's the easiest one, maxcarlis.com. I've also rescored the AFL league, to, but with minus one for a behind instead, just for fun. And that's what was the result? It. Or is that a spoiler? About, about one in five games, you get a different winner. Brizzy would have won the grand final. All right, um, there we go. We're going to change the course of AFL, maybe. There'll be a lot of other Melbourne team supporters that would be happy about that. But yeah, really appreciate your time again. Thanks so much, Max. Thoroughly enjoyed Anytime. it. Thank you. All good. All Take right. care. Cheers, Chris. Bye. Okay, so that's it for this episode. If you're hearing this message, you've listened all the way to the end. So thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please leave us a review and share this episode with your friends, team members, leaders, if you think it'll make a difference. After all, we're trying to help you, the entrepreneurs, kick more goals within your organizations. If you have any questions about the things we covered in the show, please email me directly at chris at companyroad.co. I answer all messages, so please don't hesitate to reach out. And to hear about the latest episodes and updates, please head to companyroad.co to subscribe. Tune in next Wednesday for another new episode.